Four years ago, in the summer of 2005, over 100 Palestinian social justice and human rights organizations joined under the banner of Palestinian civil society. Together, they sent a call out to groups and individuals all around the world to impose broad boycotts and implement divestment initiatives against Israel, similar to those applied to South Africa in the apartheid era. The campaign took off around the world as the Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions Movement, or BDS, and has sharply escalated since Israel's recent attack on Gaza last Christmas. Unions, faith groups, NGOs and other organizations began targeting local companies that profit from the Israeli economy, pressuring them to divest. They've also launched boycotts against Israeli products and are particularly targeting businesses that produce or profit in the occupied Palestinian territories. The campaign has claimed responsibility for the recent announcement of Belgian-French financial group Dexia of its divestment from providing loans to Israeli settlements in the West Bank. Another claimed victory was the abandonment of French company Veolia of a controversial light rail project in Jerusalem that was meant to connect West Jerusalem with Jewish settlements in occupied East Jerusalem. Now, activists are ramping up a campaign against Israeli cosmetics firm Ahava. During the Gaza attack, British activists shut down a central London store that carried Ahava products. In July, French activists picketed a Parisian store. And most recently, U.S.-based group Code Pink protested in front of stores selling Ahava products in Israeli and in American cities. The Real News caught up with them in Washington, D.C. I'm Ray Abalea. I work with Code Pink. When I was in high school, I went to Israel with my synagogue, and I, like everybody else on my trip, came home with our Ahava beauty uh, souvenirs to give to friends and family. I didn't know at the time or understand the horrible occupation of Palestine, and now that I understand that Ahava is produced in the occupied territories and that they are profiting from the illegal occupation of Palestine, I have stopped buying Ahava and I've joined the boycott and will do everything I can to let my friends, family and folks that I know and work with uh, know that this is a product that's breaking international law and they shouldn't buy it. And we want to send a clear message to Israel that they can't continue business as usual. Ahava's processing plant and welcoming center are indeed located in the Palestinian territories and in Israeli settlements on the Dead Sea called Mitzpah Shalem. According to a 2004 ruling of the International Court of Justice, Israeli settlements in occupied territories are illegal, as the West Bank is still occupied territory captured by Israel in the War of 1967. Besides having been established 10 years after the occupation of what was then the West Bank of Jordan, making it an illegal settlement by international law, Mitzpah Shalem was also part of a project of the Israeli army. It was established in 1977 by Nahal, an infantry brigade engaged in social and agricultural development, mostly in occupied areas. West Bank Israeli settlements established the Ahava company and control nearly half of its shares. The other half is split between two investment firms, the lion's share belonging to powerful Israeli Livnat families, Hamashbir Holdings. The family is listed in the Israeli Daily Haaretz list of 100 most influential people in Israel. Besides its investment in Ahava, the Livnat family profits in various ways from the economy of the occupation. The family began its ascension to power before the State of Israel was even created, with a modest transport company, Tavura. Founded by Livnat brothers Yitzchak and Avraham, Tavura is today's Israel's largest transport company and its Livnat family founder is described by the editor of Israeli daily Yediota Chonot as a real estate, vehicle, commerce, communications, insurance, and banking tycoon, and a major shareholder in IDB Holdings Corporation. Besides its ownership in Ahava, the Livnat family sits on the board of IDB Holdings Corporation, Israel's largest investment conglomerate. Many of the family's subsidiaries and firms are also part of the IDB enterprise. Many benefit directly from the occupation by either placing their factories in the West Bank or building the infrastructure of the settlement network. For example, some of the Livnat family's biggest investments are in agricultural firms that grow produce in the West Bank and the occupied Golan Heights. Their IDB companies also produce cement for the construction of the segregation wall, and other companies such as fiberglass manufacturer FiberTech base their factories in the occupied West Bank. The reason why the Livnat families Ahava and other Israeli companies choose to hold their factories in the occupied territories and not in Israel proper, says Merav Amir of Who Profits, is because of government incentives.
There is a considerable uh, reduction in real estate prices when you move to the territories. Most of the area in the West Bank is considered what the Israeli government defines as priority area A, which means that they, there are uh, very significant tax reductions over there and uh, different uh, benefits that they get from the government when you open a business in the uh, in a priority area uh, for the workers as well as for the, the employers and for the businesses themselves and until 2003 although uh, businesses in the West Bank were supposed to pay taxes uh, they were never collected reports by the uh, like internal critics critic of the government. In the report, they exposed the fact that the uh, tax revenues weren't uh, collected in the West Bank, and then they started collecting these taxes. The third thing that makes opening a business in the West Bank very attractive is that although there are different kinds of regulations, such as uh, environmental regulations, there is very lax implementations of these regulations in, in the West Bank. So many times... What you you would find there, what you would uh, normally uh, consider, uh, you know, what the NIMBY businesses are, not in my backyard uh, type of business, businesses, factories that are either highly polluting or are very undesirable for uh, several for other reasons for people who live around them. So uh, many times businesses would move to the West Bank because they they won't get objections from their neighboring uh, residents, because if you're in an area which is uh, populated by Palestinians, then they have no say about who, who comes and, and who can open a business around their houses or around their places of res residence. The additional incentive for, for many of these businesses is the having access to very cheap labor by the Palestinians. But the Livnat family doesn't just produce cement for the construction of the segregation wall. It actually helped build it. In the 1980s, one of the Livnat family's sons moved to the Netherlands and became a major shareholder in Rewal, a crane company that helped build the segregation wall. An electronic intifada report from 2006 exposed that in a statement, the company admitted its involvement in the building of the wall and argued that the related activities were accepted and executed purely as a commercial order. The same International Court of Justice decision that ruled the Israeli settlements in the occupied West Bank were illegal also ruled that the segregation wall Israel is building is also illegal. The Dutch government then warned Rewal to cease construction. But even in 2007, Haaretz reported that the peace group that led the campaign against Rewal, United Citizens for Peace, submitted evidence showing that Rewal was still providing equipment for the wall's contractors. The Real News contacted Rawal, asking whether they were still engaged in construction of the wall. In an email response, Rick Moskant, who does public relations for Rawal Israel and its Dutch sister company, denied any involvement. Neither Rawal Holdings Group nor Rawal Israel is involved in the construction or maintenance of the safety barrier in Israel, nor do either of them have the intention to be in the future. But in spite benefiting from the land of the occupied West Bank, the construction of the occupation infrastructure, and supplying products and services to the illegal settlements under international law, the Livnat family is facing some serious challenges. Activists are pushing for the company's divestment from the occupation economy. Here we are in front of this pharmacy in Washington, D.C. that carries a product called Ahaba. Uh, on the product it says that it's made in Israel, but we were just in Israel. We visited the factory. It's not made in Israel. It's made in occupied Palestine. It's made with land stolen from the Palestinians, resources from the Dead Sea stolen from the Palestinians. This mud that we have on is stolen mud from the Palestinian territories. So we've launched a boycott to ask people around the world to stop buying Ahaba products. And but the Israeli government doesn't see the problem. Daniel Seaman, the director of the government press office, spoke to The Real News about the settlement in which Ahava is based. In his view, there is no difference between companies producing in Israel or in the occupied territories, because in his view, they are all part of a greater Israel. In special M is in territories. It doesn't matter. I mean, special M is in, is in Israel. It's not in the territories. That's the whole thing. Special M is not in the territories. What they're talking about, it's in the, the Jordan Valley. 
part of the land of Israel. What difference does it make? I don't, I don't, I don't get what their problem is. So anything produced by an Israeli company is Israeli. But according to numerous resolutions of the United Nations General Assembly and even those of the Security Council, settlements established after 1967 in the occupied West Bank, Gaza, East Jerusalem or the Golan Heights have no legal validity and constitute a serious obstruction to achieving a comprehensive, just and lasting peace in the Middle East. So however they label their products, Israeli companies have been feeling the crunch of the economic downturn coupled with the international boycott campaign. The Israeli business newspaper The Marker reported in March the results of its survey, revealing that a fifth or 21% of Israeli businesses are directly impacted by the international boycott, divestment and sanctions campaign.